turned the heater on outside, but she wouldn't do it. She said Duke Power told her not to do it. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that one out, but it's all right. And it's good to see you in the Lord's house tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. Let me just uh, remind you of a few things uh, that's going on. As soon as my wife gets back to the computer. Tomorrow night, the uh, production company meeting has been canceled tomorrow night. Is that right? So if you were a part of that, uh, don't forget about that. Uh, no practice tomorrow night. Uh, Saturday, the youth are meeting at Stephanie's home. And uh, Stephanie's here. If you don't know how to get to her place, she can tell you. Uh, she was here. Oh, she went to the back. Can't move on me like that. Good night. Uh, six to eight. So parents, be aware of that. And I'm sure they'll be doing some phone trees to uh, remind you about that. This coming Sunday is crazy for Jesus Day for our kids' ministry. Christian T-shirts or hats. And uh, so let your kids wear their crazy for Jesus T-shirt hat this Sunday. Next weekend, uh, January 16th, 17th, Eddie James will be having a shift conference here. Um, it's something that they're doing that they're putting on, but uh, asking all the uh, churches to participate in. They'll be having a Friday night service at 7, and then Saturday they'll have a session, a workshop session at 10, and another one at 2, and then doing another service at 7 o'clock. So they're going to be doing worship drama, and they're also going to uh, something different than they normally do. Uh, they're going to have some uh, different speakers coming in to speak this time. So uh, looking forward to that uh, conference and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us for that. So keep that in mind. Keep that in prayer. And our ninth anniversary celebration will be coming up pretty soon. And I just confirmed this week, Reggie Saddle and his family will be with us. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, he'll be with us that morning. And uh, we'll be having our dinner uh, on the grounds. Trace says she don't know why we're eating on the ground. But, uh, you know, that's the way the, the old folks say it, dinner on the grounds. Uh, but we're having our lunch that day. And I know that the ladies will be getting with you uh, about that meal uh, for that particular day. They'll be getting with you. Uh, coming up here pretty soon. So keep that in mind, and uh, we just appreciate you coming out to the Lord's house. we got a lot of folks that we need to continue to pray for, a lot of things that are going on, so we want to open up with prayer, ask God to have his way. Uh, Shirley Duff, this is Sister Debbie's mom. Uh, they have diagnosed her with metastatic bone cancer, and what that means is the cancer has gotten into her bloodstream, and uh, it's not it's not good. So uh, remember, Shirley, that God will touch her and minister her, and uh, pray for Sister Debbie. They're having to work out some uh, different issues because of this. Uh, we want to pray that the Lord would uh, work these things out uh, for His His glory and their benefit, and that God would have His way in this. So remember her, if you will. Continue to remember Sister Libby. She's been battling with bronchitis. Uh, Jennings Farley uh, is dealing with some breathing problems. Sister Debbie, we continue to pray for total healing for her. Larry and B. Hudson, uh, this couple that generally sits up here with Fanny and Terry, uh, they've been battling some sickness. Uh, Nick Dula uh, is in need of salvation, so remember him, if you will. Corey Norman, uh, continue to pray for total deliverance for him. And also uh, Jeff Tucker, uh, total deliverance for him and salvation. Continue to pray for Amy Franklin for total healing and Tammy Lott for healing. And uh, Elijah Etheridge uh, broke broke his arm. So remember them, if you will, uh, that God would touch them and minister to them. Uh, do you have a need of request that you want to make known this time? Amen. If you would, stand and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to have, our, have his way. Yeah. Still clear. Still clear. Praise God. Praise God. God's good. Amen? Amen. Uh, ushers, if you come at this time, let me give you some ushers. And we'll, we'll pray over our offering as we pray over these needs. Uh, I'm going to have to recruit some tonight. Somebody going to have to volunteer. Come on, Kevin. Come on, Johnny, help me out here. Chad, you help me out, bud. Caleb? Nope, that's it. I, I'm good there. All right. Matt, jump up here. Thank you, Matt. Good man. Let's pray over our offering. Pray over these needs and requests. We know that God's able to do this. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, let me give you a word right quick. My Uncle R.M., most of you knew that he had a tumor, a cancerous tumor that was in his back that was so bad it, it broke a bone in his back. Uh, my dad called me today, or yesterday rather, and told me that the cancer now is about the size of a quarter. So I thank the Lord for that. He does have to, uh, I mean, he was on his deathbed, and now he's able to move around a little bit. But he does have to have surgery uh, to put some rods in his back from where the bone broke. Uh, so continue to pray for him, that God would touch him and minister to him. And uh, I'm, I'm just so thankful that 
most of all, the, the this cancer part of it has, has shrunk, and, uh, and, and, and everything's working out for him there. So continue to pray for him, if you will, uh, that God will touch him. So let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come into your house. We love you, Lord, so much. We praise your holy name. We thank you, Father, that you're in control. There's absolutely nothing that comes our way, God, that catches you by surprise. Father, we just surrender our lives to you completely and wholly. Father, as we conclude today, as we conclude the first week of our 21-day fast, I just want to thank you, Lord, that you are moving and ministering and speaking our hearts, God, and that you're doing what you said you'd do, Lord. As we separate ourselves from the things of this world and separate ourselves from the things, God, that would uh, cause our flesh to uh, be strengthened, God, as we strengthen our spiritual man, God, I pray that you would just continue to let your will and your perfect will and your divine will, God, be accomplished for us here at Daystar, Lord. I pray that you'd bless those that are, are, are participating in this fast, God, that you would speak to them in their dreams, speak to them through your word, speak to them in their spirit, God. I pray that you would just move them in, in a mighty, mighty way, God. Let them feel your presence, your glory, your strength, God. I pray that everyone is praying, God, that as they're seeking your face. I know that some may not be able to participate fully in the fast because of health reasons, but God, I pray that you would move in them and minister to them. Let them feel your touch, your strength, God. For every need and request, Lord, I pray for deliverance. I pray for healing. I pray for salvation, God. I pray that you would do a mighty, mighty work, God, that only you can do. And, Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for touching John, Lord, and ministering to him and for touching my Uncle R.M., God, that you would continue to minister to him. God, that you would just bring healing, complete divine healing, God, in a mighty, miraculous way, God, that you would receive the glory. Father, we surrender this time tonight to you. We surrender this time of giving. God, I pray that you take each and every gift and use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Lord, you know what is needed here at the church, God. You know the needs of the ministry. You know the needs of each and every individual. And, Father, we just cast all our cares upon you right now, God, because we know that you care for us. And, Father, we just thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're going to do. And, Father, we thank you for the blessing that's on the way. Father, you tell us in your word that while we're even asking, the answer is on the way. And I'm thanking you tonight, God, that while we've even presented these needs to you, you're already working out a plan. You've already got a purpose in mind. You've got a will, God, a, a divine will, a perfect will, God. We thank you for what you're going to do. And, Father, we just surrender this time to you. We love you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor for all these things. And we ask you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Worship and giving. You can be seated. Appreciate you giving tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, our classes can be dismissed at this time. Our, teen, our single ladies have their class tonight. Our boys will be going to the coffee shop. And uh, the rest of the kids will be going with Sister Sheila. All right. That leaves some big old holes. Y'all feel all right over there by yourself? You good? I acknowledge you every now and then. I'll look over that way, or you can move over. It doesn't matter to me, whichever way you want to do it. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Gave you a break for just a minute. If you would stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to begin with the ninth verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible says, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee 
of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Tonight I want to minister to you on united in Christ. United in Christ. Continue our study of Ephesians. United in Christ. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to come to receive from you and receive from your word. Pray tonight, God, as we go through this teaching, God, that you would help us to have a deeper understanding of what it is that you're speaking to us, God, through your word, through this book of Ephesians. God, I believe the primary goal of the entire book is, God, that we would come unified for your purpose, for your plan, and for your will. And Father, we just surrender this time to you tonight. We love you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor for what's done and what will be done. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The first two verses of these, this text that I read to you, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. What Paul is doing here is, 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 is he's coming to grips with the fact that God has called us through Christ to a position of unity. And the way that the Scripture puts it is that it's the mystery of his will. In verse 9, it says it's the mystery of of his will. So the New Testament uses this word mystery in a very special sense. It's not something mysterious in the sense that it's hard to believe, but rather or, or, or that it's hard to understand, but rather it's something that's been long kept secret but yet now has been revealed. And so it's still incomprehensible to the person who has not been initiated into its meaning. So let, let's take an example. Suppose that we were doing a communion service and somebody that's never been in church and somebody that's never you know, participated in any Christian uh, sacraments whatsoever and we were holding a communion service and they came to the church. When they walked into the door and saw what we were doing, we were partaking of the juice and partaking of the bread, to them it would be a mystery. It was something that they had not, they had not been made known to them. It was something that they did not understand, if you will. And so what we see here is this. We see the fact that, that, that what God is working out here is that this mystery, this thing that God has been working on, this thing that God has been preparing all through history, now is coming to light through Paul's teaching and through what the revelation that God has given unto Paul. And so we see this mystery coming alive. And so to some people it might be a complete mystery, but there are some people that now it's coming to them in revelation. So this mystery is something which is hidden to non-Christians, but rather is clear to Christians. So for, for Paul, what is this mystery of God? What is, what is this mystery that, 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 that Paul is having to deal with? We see that Paul is dealing with the mystery of the will of God, that now the gospel has been revealed not only to the Jews, but now also to the Greeks or to the Gentiles also. And so in Jesus, God has revealed that his love and care, his grace and his mercy are meant not only for Jews but for the whole world. And so now Paul, in one sentence, introduces his great thought in verse 10. In verse 10, he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, in other words, in the plan of God, what God has planned out, he might gather together in one all things that are in Christ. And so God said, or G, Paul is saying here that God had a plan all through history to bring to pass this plan of bringing everything together in Christ. We can see this in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he declares unto the enemy, he says to him, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, that's how bruise his head, and he's going to bruise, or that, he's going to bruise your head, and you're going to bruise his heel. So, what? The, so God enacted a plan right there in the midst of creation to bring to pass Jesus Christ, the culmination of the Son of God, to come to bring unity within the body, within the whole world. And so Paul now sees this mystery that the gospel is now open to the entire world, especially the Gentiles. Now you got to understand something here, amongst Jewish people. People, there's a real struggle because the Jewish people think that they're the chosen people, and they are in a sense. But for guys like you and I who have a Gentile background, who have a Gentile background, to us, the Jewish people look at us as second class, second rate. 
And so for us to be a part of this promise, this Abrahamic covenant, this, this Mosaic covenant that God made through Noah and Abraham and Moses, this covenant that God made and initiated them through Christ, the Messiah, the Jews saw them being first in line for us. We were just second rate. And now through Jesus Christ, the, level, the playing field has been leveled. The playing field has been made new. And so Paul is instructed in this. And so now he's having to, 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 to bring this great thought that this plan has has been a purpose of God the entire time. So up until now, people have been living in a divided world. There was division between the animals and the human beings. There was division between the Jews and the Gentiles, the Greeks and the barbarians. And so all over the world, there was this strife and this tension and all this stuff that came out was coming in the world. But Jesus came to wipe away all those divisions, all that strife, all that tension, all that heartache. Seems like to me the world is primed for another return of Christ. With all the divisions and all the strife and all the heartache. Twelve people today lost their life in Paris because of a, a religious fanatic that was upset because of a cartoon that was put out. I mean, this is the world that we're living in right now. It's full of strife. It's full of division. It's very divisive. I mean, we're, we're, we're walking on eggshells. And I want to tell you something that's funny to me, and I'm just going to talk to you for just a minute. But I want to tell you something that's funny to me. We walk on eggshells to protect the, the feelings and the rights of Muslims. But when it comes to Christians, we don't care how they feel or what they think. It really doesn't matter. I mean, we listen, in the state of Michigan, they took state grant money to put in foot washing tubs for the Muslims in the University of Michigan to make sure that they have foot washing tubs. But I read an article this week that a 12-year-old boy was denied the right to read his Bible in free time in school. See, this is the world that we're living in. It's divisive. It's one against this one. We're pitted against this one. And listen, within the Christian community, it's just as bad. We've got religious dogma and religious doctrine that, that, that divides us. As I told you Sunday, one of the most segregated days in all of Christianity is Sunday. When it's a day when we should be able to come together. But Jesus came so that there could be unity within the body. That the, the body would be unified. And so this is the mystery that Paul is talking about. This great thought that God, all through history, that God was pulling this thing together. So for Paul, the secret of God, it, it was God's purpose that all these many different strands and all these different warring elements in this world should be gathered together in one in Christ Jesus. And so here we have another tremendous thought. Paul says again that history has been working out of this process. Out of this process. He says that all through the ages, there has been an arranging and an administering of things so that this day of unity should come. God was uniquely and purposely orchestrating and putting things in line. Now, I want to tell you something. When you read the Old Testament and you look how Christ came, and you look at some of the avenues through which family members came. I mean, you got father-in-laws sleeping with their daughter-in-laws, and they were bearing sons, and through that line, Jesus came. You got men committing adultery with a, with a woman and, and then having her husband murdered so he could keep her. Jesus came. I mean, you got you got you got uh, people of 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 a, of a Moabite background. A, a Moabite is sleeping with a Jew, and through that the son uh, a son came, and through that line Jesus came. I mean, all through all through Jesus's history, we see what some would determine as a big mess, but yet Jesus, God was still using all that to orchestrate his plan of history of what God intended to take place through Jesus Christ. And so this, this arranging, this administering of things, so this day of unity should come. And so the word here that Paul uses in verse 10, the word here is, 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 uh, is, is interesting. It, the word is oikonomia. It literally means household management. The, 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 there was a steward in that day 
who saw to it that the family affairs ran smoothly. There, there was, there's always somebody that made sure Eliezer was the steward of, of, of Abraham. And so Eliezer was the one that made sure that all of Abraham's affairs run like they needed to. And so this steward was one that kind of kept everything in order. In, 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 most, in, in common day today, we see that, that, that most people uh, that are uh, uh, well-to-do or have a lot of money, they have a butler. And that's what the butler's there to do. He's to make sure that everything is organized and everything's running smooth. And so what God was saying here, or what Paul was using this word here, is that, that God was uniquely using the dispensation, the, the plan, the, the organization, the arrangement, if you will, that God was bringing all this together to make sure that we come to the culmination. The Bible said in the book of Galatians that the Bible said that when the fullness of time had come, that, 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 that the virgin brought forth the Son of God. And so what we see here is that God had a, had a divine, perfect appointment appointment for Jesus to come and to come the way that he did prophets had ordered some 300 prophecies about him. Some, 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 some 300 prophecies through the word of God through the Old Testament were uttered about Jesus. God was orchestrating this plan all the way to the point to bring to pass Christ coming to unify the body within the world. Now, let me tell you something that's encouraging to me. What's encouraging to me is, is that God from, from 4,000 years before could orchestrate and bring all this together to bring Jesus to the specific point that he did for the specific time that he did and for the specific purpose that he did how much more so can God orchestrate your life and take care of the things that's going on for you can I tell you friend when you get united with him and you live as God would have you to live and you're walking in the way that he would have you to walk God still has a plan for your life God has a way of orchestrating your life and working out the purposes and the destiny and the divine will that he has for you I'm thankful that God is in control of my life I am thankful that God is working all things for my good according to his divine will. I'm thankful that the Lord is in control of what's going on for me, aren't you? I, 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 listen, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful. That, that I've got a sovereign God, an all-seeing eye, who, who, who is looking down at, at the mess of a world that I'm living in, but yet he still has it all under control. It may seem like chaos. It may seem like it's falling apart. It may seem like you've had the worst day today than you've ever had in your life. But God still had it under control. When you think you're about to lose control, God still got it under control. When you think it's about to blow your mind, God still got it under control. When you think you're going to lose everything you got, the Lord still has his hand on you and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God will take care of his own. Listen, friend, if he's concerned about even if a little spirit it falls. He said, how much more so shall he be concerned about you? He's got the hairs of your head numbered. He knows those. He knows every hair of your head. He knows every beat of your heart. How much more so shall God take care of you? If he will clothe the lilies of the field, if he'll take care and adorn them greater than anything that Solomon ever wore, how much more so shall God take care of you? I'm thankful that the Lord is on my side. See, it is the Christian conviction that history is the working out of the will of God. By no means, every historian or thinker has been able to see this. I'm not going to go, i got a list of them here, and I'm not going to go through all them, but, but the, the, there have been historians all through history that have said, this stuff just happening. This stuff makes no sense. One, one historian said, we put it in our books and we sell it to our children as history. And he said, what I see is one emergency after another. I see one problem after another. I see one incident after another. And he said, it makes no sense to me when I look back at it. But yet, when it doesn't make sense to us, God is still in control. When it doesn't look like it makes any sense and it's not going to work it out, God is still in control. And if I can repeat myself tonight, I just want you to hear this one more time. I believe that all things work for the good of those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. You mean, preacher, my bad day, my fire on my job, my, my, my inability to pay my car payment, you mean that's working for my good? If I believe the word of God, it doesn't matter what the sickness is, it doesn't matter what the disease is, it doesn't matter what the boss man says, I believe that all things work for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I believe that God has a divine plan for everything that comes into my life. 
I believe that every step that I take is ordered by God. If I walk in the valley, I'm in the valley because God wants me in the valley. If I'm shouting on the mountaintop, I'm shouting on the mountaintop because that's where God wants me. I'm telling you, friend, I'm thankful that the Lord is in control. Preacher, why do I have to go through the valley? Because, it, listen, friend, you can't always shout on the mountaintop. There's no substance on the mountaintop. Nothing grows on the mountaintop. Everything grows in the valley. If you're going to get something that's going to sustain you, you're going to have to go through some valleys sometimes. That's where you find your strength. Listen, I know everybody wants to shout. Everybody wants to dance. Everybody wants to hoop and holler. Everybody wants to carry on. Everybody wants to leap from one mountaintop to the next mountaintop. But I'm going to tell you something. After a while, you'll be malnourished spiritually, and you're going to die. I'm telling you, the shout ain't always going to keep you. I found when I'm fighting the enemy and all the hell is broke loose in my life that a shout didn't do nothing for me. But when I got down on my knees and agonized, in prayer. I was able to see an enemy back up. I was able to see hell retreat. Why? Because I understood that God was fighting for me. Even in the valley, I found my strength to know that God was on my side. I'm telling you, friend, I'm thankful for the Lord to be on my side. Every historian ain't seen it this way, but this is the way I see it. So so it so happens that we're living in an age in which so many people have lost their faith in any purpose for this world. I mean, you, you, you and I talk to these folks. Man, I, I've talked to these folks. I mean, they, they, they say, what's the use? Why even try? What's going to happen is going to happen. I mean, when it gets around election time, i got family members and friends that tell me, why vote? They're going to do what they want to do anyway. And they approach life that way. They approach life as, why even try? What's going to happen is going to happen. If it breaks, it breaks. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And there would be people that would say, well, if God's in control and God's working all this, then we just need to just kind of fall down like blobs and let God do what God wants to do. No. Listen, we are in a cooperative effort with the creator of the heavens and the earth. And in this cooperative effort, God is working with us for our good. Listen, how can I take an ordered step by God, if I refuse to step, how can I see all things work for my good if I'm not willing to get in the mix of some all things? Amen. I told you a couple of weeks ago, if God is an ever-present help in a time of trouble, then we need to get in some trouble. Amen. Listen, I want to be where God's at. I want to be where his spirit's moving. I want to be where his power is present. I want to be where his anointing is flowing. I want to be where the unction is. I want to be in the midst of the glory of God. And the only place that I'm going to find that, the only i got to be where God's at. Because if God's not moving here, I want to move somewhere else to find where God's moving. I want to feel and sense the moving of the presence of God. I need him. So it happens that we're living in this age where people have lost their faith. But it's the faith of Christians that in this world, God's purpose is being worked out. And Paul's conviction is, is that it's God's purpose that one day all things and all people should be one family in Christ. Listen, God's going to bring this thing together. You know, it's easy for us within the Christian realm to look at other people that call themselves Christians who are really dropping the ball and messing up and doing things they shouldn't be doing. It's easy for us to, you know, to, uh, to get discouraged. You know, and we see that, but I, I just want to remind you tonight that God still got a people. Woo. Just like he told Elijah. He said, Elijah, I got 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Can I tell you that God still got multitudes upon thousands upon thousands of people that, that, that are still loving him and consecrated to him and separated for his purpose. I know, friend, it can get discouraging when you've done all you know to do to try to live right. And it seems like everybody around you seems to be falling apart. What do I do, preacher? I say keep on keeping on. Don't back down. Don't give up. Keep pressing on to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. In other words, don't give up. It's like that bullfrog that the pelican swallowed. Have you ever seen that picture? All you see is two arms outside that pelican's mouth holding on to the throat of that pelican. Those frog, that frog saying, I'm not giving up. You might have me in your mouth, but you ain't going to get me down the throat. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that way. I feel like I'm struggling with life, and life is struggling against me. But I'm hanging on because God promised me there's a hope. Woo, glory. 
There's a hope at the end of this tunnel. There's a light at the end of this thing. And I know it might seem dark and dreary on days. It's cold and nasty outside. But I'm telling you, I got a hope. I got a hope that's beyond any hope this world could ever imagine. I got a hope that's at the end of this thing that the Lord has promised me. And if I can just get one with him and walk as he'd have me to walk and live as he'd have me to live, I know that at the end of this thing, it's all going to be worth it. Paul said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us in other words. It's going to be worth it when you get to the end of this thing. So keep pressing on. Don't give up. Don't back down. Allow the Lord to do in your life what he said he would do. So this mystery that Paul's talking about, it's not even grasped until Jesus came. So now it is the great task of the church to work out God's purpose of unity, which was revealed in Jesus Christ. Let, let, let's look at these next few verses. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. The Bible says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now, now I want you to notice something here. Paul is writing to the Ephesians church and he's using language. And the language that Paul is using here, he, he's, in these initial verses, he's discriminating between us and you. So, so he's still, in some regards, identifying himself with the Jewish race. And he's saying, us and you. Let, let me start this over again, Steph. You can go back to verse 11. He said, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of the glory. So what Paul is saying here is, listen, we, we were the first ones. This thing was to us. And now, now in verse 13, he said, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee, or the uh, King James says the earnest, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So now Paul brings it all together. At first it's us and you. Then he says when Christ came, now it's us. And it's all us. And so he brings it to a, a little bit more of, 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 unifying, uh, of a unifying topic. He said, who is the guarantee or the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So, so let's look at these verses here for just a moment. Here's Paul's first example of the new unity which Christ brings. Again, he speaks of us. He means his own nation, the Jews. When he speaks of you, he means the Gentiles to whom he is writing. And, and when, it, when in the very last sentence he uses we or us, it is, it, is, it is of Jews and Gentiles together that he's thinking. So first of all, Paul speaks of the Jews. They too had their portion assigned to them in the plan of God. God's got a plan for even the Jewish nation. They were the first to believe in the coming of the anointed one of God. All through their history, they had dreamed of and expected the Messiah. Listen, that's what every, listen, every, Every young girl coming up in the Jewish nation wanted to be used by God to be the mother of the Messiah. It, it was a dream of theirs. I mean, because they had been, it, had, it, had been, it had been poured into them from childhood that God was going to send his only son to a virgin. And so they were all anticipating that opportunity to possibly be the, the, the aqueduct or the, or, the, or the avenue to which God would bring his son. And so it was always this dream. And so even coming up, I mean, I preached about it Sunday night. We talked about the woman at the well. Even the woman, the Samaritan woman said, I've heard that Messiah's coming. It was something that was an, that was, there was an expectancy about it. Sort of like the expectancy that you and I have. He's coming. I, I stopped there and preached and shout for a little while, but I can't, I, I, I get carried off. With, but he's coming. I know all these reports of murders and terrorist attacks and all this. I'm, I'm telling you, he's coming. Oh, abortion numbers are up. And families turning against family members. and People turning against one another. All these people doing this crap, but God is coming. Can I tell you, friend, there is still an expectancy deep down inside of my soul. I can't speak for nobody else, but inside of me that the Lord is coming. And today could be the day. This could be the month. This could be the year. I don't know, but I know one thing. He's coming. Ah, oh, glory to God. So, so there was an expectancy amongst the Jews. And so their part in the scheme of things was to be the nation from whom God's chosen one should come. Adam Smith, a famous 18th century economist, argued that the whole pattern of life was founded on what he called the division of labor. He meant that life can only go on when each person has a job and does that job. And when the results of all the jobs are pooled and become the common stock. 
In other words, the shoemaker makes the shoes, the baker breaks bread, the tailor makes clothes, individuals have their own jobs, and they stick to their own job. And when each one of them efficiently carries out that job, the total good of the whole community follows. In other words, I am so thankful that there is a water plant somewhere in this community that somebody mans and takes care of to make sure that I got fresh, clean water coming to my house. Amen. I'm glad that no matter what store I go to, whether it be Ingles or Walmart or Bilo or, or that's about all we got left, ain't it? I don't care. Listen, I am thankful that there are people working in those stores and driving those trucks to get that food there to stock the shelves so I can feed my family. In other words, everybody within a community has a position or a job to fulfill. And when everybody does it what they're supposed to do, the community becomes what it's supposed to be. Same thing within the church. When everybody does what they are supposed to do and we come together, it culminates into the church. Listen, it doesn't matter if you put a bunch of people in a building and they call themselves a church. It's only that they are doing what they're supposed to do and they come together in unity. Then you can really identify it as a church. Listen, Brian, I said it before and I'll say it again. Church is not an address on a street on a letterhead. It's not that. Church is what we are. The building's not the church. The, 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 the facilities is not the church. You and I are the church and God operates through the church and we are the church. But we got to function in the way that God has call us to function in order to really honorably walk under the banner of being called the church. So, so he, he sees this total good of the whole community following. So what is true of individuals was also true of nations. So each nation in the world had its part in God's scheme of things. Listen, when, when, when Israel went into Babylonian captivity, God raised up Babylon and strengthened them and gave them what they needed to do to, to, to render judgment upon uh, Israel. Israel cried out to God in repentance. God delivered them from Babylon. And then when Israel turned again, God rose up the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians was rose up and was, was made into a great nation, they overtook Israel, took Israel into captivity. And while they were in captivity, God judged them. God raised up Rome. And when God raised up Rome, and Rome became strong, and Israel fell out uh, with God again and began to worship false gods and false idols, they went into Roman captivity. And, and, and that's where they were at the time of Christ. And can I tell you something, friend? We're in the same boat here in the United States of America. We're falling away from God, and there's going to be a nation that rises up if the Lord tarries, and He's going to overtake us, and we're going to be in a big old mess. You know why? Because this nation has turned this back on God. But I come to declare to you that this nation might have turned this back on God, but God has not turned his back on us. If we'll just keep our eyes forward and we'll look into the hills from which cometh our help, our help comes from the Lord. I'm thankful that God's eyes are upon the righteous. I'm thankful that his ear is open to our cry. No matter what the world does, no matter what this nation does, no matter what the president does, no matter what the Congress does, it doesn't matter. God's eye and ear are still open to us and God's going to take care of us. See, See, every nation had its part. The Greeks taught what beauty of thought and form is. The Romans taught law and the science of government and administration. The Jews taught religion. The Jews were the people who had been prepared through history for the appearance of God's Messiah from among them. So that's not to say that God did not prepare other people too. All over the world, God had been preparing individuals and nations so that their minds would be ready to receive the message of Christianity when it came. God was working for one purpose, for Christ to come and to bring unity to the body. The great privilege of the Jewish nation was that they were the first to expect the coming of the northern one of God into the world. But Paul turns to the Gentiles in this passage. I'm getting ready to close. That makes some of you happy. In their development of the Gentiles, he sees two stages. Number one, they receive the word. They receive the word. The Christian preachers brought the Christian message. That word was two things. Number one, it was a word of truth. The Scripture says you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The Gentiles received the word with gladness and were made free. They were set free. They heard that word of truth. It brought them the truth about God and about the world in which they lived and about themselves. Number two, it was good news. It was the message of the love and the grace of God. Boy, I'm thankful for that message. And see, this is the message. The Gentiles, they received the word. It was a word of truth, and it was a word. It was, it was good news to them. They, 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 they found out that there was a God that loved them, that died for them, that, that purchased them, that sealed them with the Holy Spirit, and now here they are. Number two, they were sealed with that Holy Spirit. I'm a truck driver by my second trade. And any time I pull a trailer, 
Johnny, you'll know this. They always put a seal on there. And that seal has a set of numbers on there, and that set of numbers is identifying where it originated and also identifies where it's going. The paperwork identifies by that seal that that load originated from, say, Charlotte, and it's going to Georgia or Orlando or whatever. It's the seal was put there by the one that was in, in control to identify this is mine. This is mine. See, this is, this is what happened to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit came as a seal to say, listen, this, this load, this person is in transport from this place to that place, but I want everybody to know as they're in process that this belongs to me. See, a lot of people look at sealed like, boy, whoo, boy, we sealed. We're, nothing ever happened to us. We're, we're going to be good to go. Everything. But let's tell, I'm going to tell you something. There's been times I got to place and the seal was broken. There's places I got to times I got to place and the seal wasn't there. The seal was wrong. But I'll tell you something. God never messes up. When the Holy Spirit sealed the Gentiles, God was saying, they're not their own. They've been bought with a price, and I am sealing them. I am, I am putting my identification marks on them so that people will know they belong to me. They were sealed. It was also a custom in the ancient world. When a sack or a crate or a package was dispatched, it was sealed with a seal in order to indicate from where it had come and to whom it belonged. And so the possession of the Holy Spirit is the seal which shows that a person belongs to God. The Holy Spirit both shows us God's will enables us to do it. Boy, I'm so thankful for the Holy Ghost. He not only shows us the will of God, but gives us the power to be able to do it. So I would encourage you to seek out more of Him, that you can live a life that's united in Christ. Paul says a great thing about the Holy Spirit. He calls the Holy Spirit the earnest of our redemption, the, the, the guarantee of our redemption. The Greek word here is Erebon. Erebon was a regular feature of the Greek business world. It was a part of the purchase price of anything. It was a, it was a deposit paid in advance as a guarantee that the rest would, would in due course be paid. It's sort of like when you go buy a car, you put a down payment down, and, 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 and you're saying to them, I want this car. I'm putting a deposit on this, and this is what I want. Or purchase a house or any purchase, you put a deposit down, and that's a guarantee to the people, listen, I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm doing what I said I would do. So what did God tell us he was going to do? Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He said, and I'm going to go away, and when I go away, the Comforter's going to come, and he's going to teach you and guide you and show you all things. He's going to show you my will, and he's going to testify me. Can I tell you what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit is a guarantee. It's a redemptive guarantee by God to say, listen, what Jesus spoke some 2,000 years ago, I'm going to bring it to pass. Can I tell you, every time you feel those goosebumps, every time the hair on the back of your neck stands up, every time you feel a shout and a whoop and a holler and all that stuff is going on, uh, you ought to just go ahead and shout a little bit more and say, Lord, it's just a guarantee that you're coming back for me. It's just a guarantee that my, my redemption has been sealed by this Spirit. I, 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 I'm just a, a passenger passing through. I'm just a stranger passing through this land. But I've been sealed. I feel this seal. I feel this present. I feel this power that, God, you're going to do what you said you would do. Paul's saying that every experience of the Holy Spirit which we have in this world is just a foretaste of the blessedness of heaven. Listen, every time I shout, Boy, I can't wait to get to heaven because I can shout and don't have to get tired. And I can shout and don't have to worry about you yawning at me. Preacher, you shouldn't be so mean to us. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you the truth. I can't wait to get to heaven. Can't wait to get there. Listen, every time I feel him, it's just a foretaste of the opportunity that I get to be with him forever. He's just saying, listen, if nothing else, it's a kick in the spiritual seat of the past to say, keep going, you can make it. Listen, have you, whew, have you, 
Well, if you understand. Have you ever been down and out and it feels like, man, you just couldn't make it another day and all of a sudden God just swept in with his peace and his glory and his grace and said, just, I just want you to know I'm here. You're not in this fight alone. You're not by yourself. You can make it if you'll just keep on pressing. I'm going to give you strength. I, I know you feel weak, but in your weakness, my strength is going to be perfected and you can make it. It's going to be all right. Just keep on going. Keep on moving. You get down and pray and you don't even know why you're praying, but all of a sudden you feel the presence of God and you're so thankful to the point that you don't have any other words to say, but hallelujah, I praise you, Jesus. Can I tell you, friend, I've been there. I've had times that I wanted to pray for people and I wanted to call out names and I wanted to call out situations, but I was so overwhelmed and so bombarded, I just didn't know what to say. And so all I could do was sit there and all of a sudden the presence of God came in and when I felt his presence, all I could do then was say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden the Spirit began to speak with me with utterances that couldn't be understood because I didn't know what I should pray. But God began to pray for me because I was so overwhelmed. I'm telling you, son, there is an, there's an assurance that God has given us through the power of the Holy Ghost that God is going to be there for us. He, he's the Erebon. He's the down payment. It's the deposit that he's going to do what he said he would do. The highest experiences of Christian peace and joy which this world can afford are only faint foretaste of the joy into which one day we'll enter. You think this is living? Ooh, I can't wait to get there. You think this is great? Boy, you wait till you get there. Paul put it one place. He said, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man all the things which God has prepared for us. Ooh, boy, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm telling you. We, listen, when I, when I was coming to church about 5, 5 15 this evening, I, I got to look at that, that, that beautiful sky my, my father painted. I, I make it personal. My father painted that just for me, just for me to look at while I was coming to his house. I, I, I even took a picture of it sitting at my wife because I knew she was in the bathroom in front of the mirror still fixing her hair and she was going to miss it. I knew where she was. She ain't back there. Don't look at her. That's why I'm talking like this. So I sent her a picture of it. And it was just an encouragement to say, listen, I'm wor- listen, as beautiful as that was, as beautiful as that sunset was, as beautiful as the colors, and, 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 you know, just a few months ago, we was, we was all enamored by, by the beautiful leaves and the colors and the oranges and the yellows and the browns and all these different colors. And, and we, we go to aquariums and we see all the beautiful fish and we look at the awesomeness of the oceans and the mountains and all the majestic scenery that we have here on this earth. Yet God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered the heart of man all the things which God has prepared for us. Listen, folks. If I've got one reason to love my enemy, it's because I want to go to heaven. If I've got one reason to forgive those that have despitefully used me and hurt me, it's because I want to go to heaven. As Brother Major used to sing, oh, I want to see him, to look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. Folks, I want to see him. I want to behold him in all his glory. I want to see him in all his power. I want to see him in all his majesty. And I want to tell you something, friend. I don't want anything or anybody or any circumstance or any situation to hold me back. I don't want to be so foolish to get hung up in something that's going on here that I might miss the opportunity to be there. I don't want that to come to my life. I want to hang on and keep on hanging on. And when people pull at me and situations tug at me and they try to knock me down and keep me back, I want to just keep fighting them off and loving them, heaping coals of fire on on the head, do whatever I got to do to keep myself going because I want to press toward that mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And when you get united with Christ and you become one with Him, you can become one with one another. And in that, God's favor and God's divine will will be accomplished in your life. Don't you want it? Well, I want it. Listen, I'll tell you something. I, I, I know that some people got scared of the cold. And I know some people just got the cold and maybe in the flu. And I know some people working. But let me say this. For the few in number that are here tonight, if we could get united in one mind, one purpose, and one accord, I'm telling you, if God could take 12 knuckleheads like he did with his disciples, and one one of them forsook him, and then he took one that was killing people, thinking he was doing God a favor, and put him a part of the apostleship and turn the world upside down. What could God do with us, folks? What could God do with us? Listen, I, 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 I spent some time over this afternoon talking to the Lord. I, I, I said, God, I, 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 want, I want 2015, Lord, to be the best year of ministry I've ever experienced. 
And I'll tell you something, folks, in 20, 21 years now, I've experienced some things. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen some, I've seen some amazing things. I've seen God do some supernatural things. But I'm serious. In my time of prayer and fasting that I'm believing for for the first year, I want 2015 to be the best year I've ever seen. And I'm not asking God to give me great numbers. I'm not asking God to give me great, great numbers of people or great numbers of money. I, I'm not asking for that, folks, because that, that, you know, those things are, those things, that, that, that they come and go. They fluctuate. But I'm saying, God, I just want to see more of you. I want to see more of your power, more of your anointing. I want to get consecrated more, God, that I can live for you, that I can see and behold the things that you said I could see and behold. God, if not in this life, in the next. I, I, somewhere or another, God, I, I want to behold you in all your glory and all your beauty and all your wonder. Man, God, I want to see you. I don't know about you, but I want this year to be the best that it could possibly be. There's some things, listen, there's some things I want to ask of you. There's some things I, I'm believing that God wants us to do in this community. I, 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 I'm, I'm believing that God's going to work some things out, that we're going to be able to make some differences. I'm believing for that. But I'm telling you, there's got to be a coming together. There's got to be a coming uh, uh, together of one mind, one accord. There's got to be a coming together to say, you know what, we're, we're here for a unified purpose. You know, that's why I like working with CPC. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what denomination. It doesn't matter what belief. It doesn't matter what theological thought. When people come together to save a life of a baby, they put all that stuff aside. Man, I want to tell you something. God blesses that. I, 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 and, and that's what I want to see. That's what I want to see amongst the church. You know, I want to make connections with Baptists and Presbyterians and Wesleyans and and Pentecostals and Assemblies of God and, and Pentecostal Holiness and Church of God. And I want to make those connections and come together with them and say, listen, let's make a difference in the Lincoln County. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to get those non-denominational people that don't know who they are and help them figure out who they are. Amen. I, I want to see God do it. Listen, I know God can do it. I believe the Lord's got a plan. I believe God's got a will for 2015, and I think it'll be bigger and better than anything we could ever imagine. If we just put our mind to him and, and watch this step that we take here and say, God, that's by you, and I want to praise you for that step. God, whoo, that step right there, God, I just want to praise you for that step. I told you the Lord dealt with me before the first year because I kept asking him to give me this picture. And God told me, said, can you just trust me for the next step? You know, and, and, and so I'm at the point now, I'm just saying, okay, God, I thank you for that step right there. That was ordered by you, Lord. I don't know where it's leading me to, and I can't see ahead of me, but God, I know that you're in control. And so if I step this way, God, you're in control, and you're going to make a way for me. Listen, if he leads me in desert places, he can provide streams in the desert. Amen. If he leads me in the valley, I will not fear. If I'm even walking in the valley of the shadow of death because God's with me. Boy, I'm glad to know that I can be united with him. And he, wherever he leads me, I'll follow. Amen. Amen. God's such a good God. Do you love him tonight? Come on, give him a praise, would you? God's so good. God's so good. Let's stand. I appreciate you coming out tonight and, and uh, enduring me for a little while. Amen. Got some things I want you to help me pray about. I'm gonna, I want you to put it on your prayer list as we're praying over these next couple of weeks. Something I was talking to the Lord today about is a tutoring program. I, 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 want, I want somebody to pray and ask God what, he have, what he'd have you to do and, and, and maybe help us get a tutoring pro program started for our school children here. I, I want us to pray specifically for our, for our outreach ministries, especially that concerns our kitchen. And uh, I, I asked God today, I said, Lord, I, I'd, like, I'd like to uh, raise enough money to get us a walk-in cooler and a walk-in freezer so that we can stock foods here and take care of people that, that are in need. So, so I, I, I'm asking God for some specific things, okay? Uh, you know, I, I, I repented a little bit today because, uh, you know, there's some things that I've repented for before. And I, I talked to the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I don't want to be slack and I don't want to be slope and I don't want to miss your plan. I, I, want, I want to do what you call me to do. Listen, folks, I, 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 I've got big dreams, big ideas because I know I serve a big God. Amen. Who's able to do exceeding abundant above all that I ask or even think. Amen. So whatever I put before him, God can blow my mind even with the thing I've asked him. But I also know that if I ask in faith and believe, and it's for his glory, that God will work all things for our good. Amen. I'm believing for that. So I want you, I want you to begin to help us pray. Men, those of you that like to help us, we've got, we got some projects that we're getting ready to commit to. I need about six or seven men that will help me uh, uh, do some things um, construction-wise. We're going we're gonna to start helping some folks out uh, with some decks, some elderly folks with some ramps and different things like that to try to help people get in and out of their home and things like that. Uh, Brother Jim's not with us tonight, but uh, he's kind of helping me coordinate that. But uh, as soon as we can get a project, but I need about six or seven men that will commit to me that on some Saturdays we we'll take a couple hours and go out and do some stuff and help some people within the community. We want to we won't make that difference. So uh, we're going to try to get some of our young boys involved so they can learn some things and teach them 
uh, some things like that and try to work with them on that also. So um, uh, Brother Jim will be here Sunday. If, if you will, please don't come tell me because I'll be forgot, okay? Uh, go to him. If you see him on Sunday, and most of you know who Brother Jim is by now, uh, and let him know, hey, I want to I wanna help out with those uh, construction projects. He'll know exactly what you're talking about, okay? So we can, so we can make. It, we we just want to make a difference. We want to see God do some things, and we got some other things that we we're talking about doing. We got um, some things that everybody can be involved with. We want to do some things at the laundromat uh, to kind of minister to the people in the community, uh, and, and some different things. And I'll get those ideas out to you as soon as I can. Uh, we, we're gonna try to put my ducks in a row before we put too much out there. I don't want to overload you and say we're gonna do this, 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 and then you know one or two things get done. And all of a sudden you're like, what? What happened? All the other stuff we're gonna do. Let's let, let's master one thing. Amen. Listen, one of the greatest ministries you can get involved with in this community is Christian ministries. If you're not involved with Christian ministries, I encourage you to get involved with Christian ministries. If any time that we have an opportunity to go and make a difference at Christian ministries, you, you, need, you need to try to make plans to be there. I know that they don't need a lot of people in the kitchen, but uh, Victor goes, and he don't even cook, serve, or nothing. He just stands out there and does what he does best, talks to people. Amen. Three souls saved the last time, the time before last that they were there. It makes a difference, folks. These, these folks don't think anybody cares. And you put a face to them and start talking to them and love on them, I'm telling you, they'll open up and share. You can pray with them make a difference. Amen? So please don't forget about these things that are going on. Uh, the youth have uh, got their event at Stephanie's house. She's back there in the back. If, so if you're not sure where she lives and you want to make sure your kids can get there, see her before she leave and uh, find out directions. They don't live too far from here. As a matter of fact, it's, what is it, Stephanie, two miles maybe from here? Something like that, maybe two miles. It's not far. If you know where the sheriff's department is, she don't live too far from there. She did that on purpose so she keep Greg in line. She threatens him every now and then. I'm going to call the sheriff. He'll come there and get you. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. Amen. But uh, don't forget about those things. And uh, the Eddie James coming up the week after next. Let friends and family know it's going to be a great time of worship, great time of word, a uh, great time of learning. Uh, so if you're interested in those kind of things, those that will be going on. And then our anniversary service coming up the uh, ninth, uh, I mean, the 1st of February, February 1st. And uh, we'll be celebrating that day. And, uh, Reggie Sadler and his family will be with us that day, and we're looking forward to a great time. He's always a hoot when he gets he gets in front of a crowd. He's a hoot. Sometimes when he ain't in front of a crowd, he's still a hoot. But uh, uh, it, it'll be a great time, great time of fellowship, and we're looking forward to a great time of the Lord. I think I covered it all. God's good. You good? All right, all right. I can dismiss now. So Jeanette's good. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity that you gave us to come into your house, God, to learn of you. And I pray, God, that some way, somehow, through this word tonight, the teaching of this word, God, that you would make the difference. God, that you would take people to levels they never thought possible. God, allow them to allow this word in Ephesians, God, to drive us to a place of unity. God, that we can see what the early church did, the first church did, God, the difference that was made in them. Lord, as they, they, they strove to, to walk together and, and be together. God, they had to overcome differences just like we do. God, there, there, there's uh, sociological differences and economic differences and theological differences. God, there was a lot of differences they had to overcome. But, Lord, they were able to do it and begin to walk in unity and see your power and your presence move. And, God, I'm believing for that, for this community, for this time, God, that you called us into. And I just want to say again, Lord, I'm praying for this year to be the best year that we've ever seen in ministry. God, I, I'm, not asking for, I'm not asking for frivolous things. I'm not asking for things, God, that, that, that I, know you, I know you're concerned about them. Lord, I'm not asking you for... For debt reduction, I'm not. Ask, I'm just asking you, Lord, that you would just show up and move and minister. And I know, God, that whatever comes our way, you'll be in control of it, God. And we just surrender it to you. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's accomplished, what will be accomplished. Bless these folks. Keep them warm tonight, God, I pray. Help them to just to relax in the warmth of their homes. God, I pray that you keep them in your arms and your care. And we'll make your face shine upon them. Let your grace rest upon them. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a great night.